Snowflake by Paul Gallico. The snowflake was born on a cold winter's day, far up in the sky, many miles above the earth. Falling, 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 as gently as lying in a cradle rocked by the wind, drifting downward like a feather, blown this way and that. Snowflake found herself floating in a world she had never known before. She thought to herself, Here I am, but where did I come from? And what was I then? Where have I been? Where am I going? Who made me and all my brothers and sisters all about me? And why? There was no answer to these questions. Looking about her, Snowflake could see hundreds upon hundreds of other flakes tumbling down as far as the eye could reach, and they were silent too. It was strange, Snowflake thought, to see so many of her brothers and sisters, newborn like herself, on every side, and yet to feel so alone. No sooner had she thought this when it seemed as though she became aware that all about her there was a kind of dear and tender love, the feeling as of someone caring that filled her through and through with warmth and sweetness. As dawn began to come to the dark world through which Snowflake was tumbling on her long journey to the earth, the sky turned first the blue color of steel, then gray, then Pearl, and looking at herself as she tumbled over and over, fragile and airy as the wind that blew her, Snowflake knew that she was beautiful. While there were millions of flakes born of the same storm, each was different from the other. Snowflake felt grateful to the one who'd given her such beauty and wished she knew how it came about that in an instant he was able to create them all, each one as lovely as a jewel, and yet no two of them alike. Soon Snowflake could make out objects below her, dark tops of mountains and slopes of snow, forests of trees standing up straight, and on the side of a hill a village with houses and barns and a church with a round steeple shaped like an onion. Snowflake landed gently, with hardly a jar, in a field on the mountainside, just outside the village, and the journey was over. The wind blew the clouds away, the sky became brighter, and then a miracle began to happen. First, the very tip of the snow-capped mountain peak across the valley was touched with delicate rose. Slowly it spread to the next summit, and then the next. The snow everywhere was touched with it, and soon even the air itself was filled with pinkness, as though the whole world were but the mirror of a rose petal. And Snowflake, too, saw that she was no longer white, but bathed like everything else in this soft and beautiful color. Snowflake thought it was so beautiful made her want to cry. It was her first sunrise. Later in the morning, Snowflake had a surprise. Down the hill, on a high wooden sled with steel runners, came a little girl with flaxen pigtails, bright blue eyes, and red cheeks like two rubber balls. She was the merriest little girl, and she sat bravely upright on her sled wearing a red cap and red mittens on her fingers. As she passed over, the steel runner cut deeply into Snowflake's heart and hurt her cruelly so that she gave a little cry. But the girl did not hear. She was quickly gone and only her joyous shouts drifted back in the cold morning air. Now that the storm was over and the day had come, Everybody in the village went about his business again. 
the cold, clear winter's day was filled with the sound of sawing and chopping and hammering and planing, with snuffling and grunting and crowing and clucking. One night it began to snow again. The new snowstorm lasted all day and all night, and when it was over, Snowflake was buried under many feet of the new fall. It was quite dark, and she could no longer see anything. She strained eagerly for all the well-known sounds that told her that even while she lay buried and forgotten, life in the village was going on. Thus began a new life for Snowflake, and it was not a happy one. Each time there was a fresh storm, or the rain fell and turned the surface to a hard crust of ice, it grew deeper and darker where she lay. Soon, even the sounds barely came through to her. What made Snowflake the saddest was the thought that she had been abandoned by the one who had created her and whose love had made her feel so happy and secure in the cradle of the wind when first she was born. She said, Dear one who made me, have you forgotten me? I am lonely and afraid. Please help me. Take me out of the darkness and let me see the light once more. And having asked that, she added timidly, I love you. As soon as she had said that, she no longer felt so lonely, but happy and excited instead, as though perhaps something wonderful might be about to happen to her. It began first with a strange drumming that sounded from overhead and seemed to go on endlessly. It was the noise made by rain when first it falls in the early spring upon the hard crust of the winter's snow. The long rains at last had filtered down from above and the waters were moving restlessly beneath the layers of frozen snow and ice that still covered the earth. The darkness in which she had lived so long turned to deep blue, then emerald green, changing to yellow as though a strong light was shining through a heavy veil. The next moment, as though by magic, the veil was lifted. Overhead the sun, warm and strong, burned from a cloudless sky. Snowflake was free once again. Her heart gave a great shout. The sun, the sun, dearly beloved sun, how glad I am to see you. What a different world it was from the mass of grey and white into which she had been born. Now everything was fresh and green and carpeted with flowers. All about her now there was the rushing, liquid music of running waters. And because of the great joy and happiness she felt, Snowflake too began to run. She ran through a quiet wood and awakened the first violet beneath its broad green leaf. She ran. And as she did so, she noticed for the first time that something strange had happened to her. A most wondrous and exciting change had taken place. Snowflake was no longer a lace-like creature of stars and crosses, triangles and squares, all woven into one pattern that was all her own. Now she was round and as pure as the morning light, crystal clear, and like a tiny silver mirror, she was able to catch and give back every color in the world about her. And there was another change that had taken place as well. Snowflake could not stop running when she'd started down the hill. She did not know that she had begun a long journey, that she must run ever more but not until the end of her days would she ever again be still.
Not long after, Snowflake had an adventure which frightened her. The banks of the stream narrowed, and Snowflake could hear a faraway rushing and roaring, and somehow she knew that it would have to do with her. And then with a rumble like thunder, over she went, into a black abyss, and the next moment, gasping, choking, drowning, she was whipped to a white froth, crushed, torn and churned by the great wooden wheel of a mill. She could not even cry for help, so shaken was she by what was happening to her. She was sure that she had reached the end of her days and was about to perish. Then the wheel sank beneath the weight of the water, and Snowflake found herself freed again. A moment later, she was again part of the calm stream, gliding along past newly budded trees. But back at the mill, she heard a woman saying to the miller, What beautiful white flour! I will buy a kilo and bake bread for my husband and children. She was still shaken and trembling because of what had happened to her at the mill, wondering what new perils lay before her and whether she could have the courage and strength to meet them. It was the being alone that was the most discouraging. True, she was surrounded on all sides by others like herself, but this, she found, made for one's being even lonelier, that they were all busy with themselves, and nowhere did she hear a friendly voice, nor did anyone seem to care about her or what happened to her. Until one bright warm day, all this was changed. She heard a voice beside her say, Hello, you're a snowflake, aren't you? I think you're beautiful. Snowflake was astonished and pleased. It was the first time that anyone had noticed her or spoken to her directly. Here I am, said the voice right beside her. I'm a raindrop. He was large, strong, and handsome in a pear-shaped way. How good it was to have someone to talk to. She asked, Where did you come from? Out of the sky, like yourself, Raindrop replied. I was born in a cloud many months ago, but did not fall until only a few days ago. I followed you down the mountain, but I didn't dare speak to you before. No? Snowflake asked. Why? Because you are so beautiful. Now Raindrop spoke more shyly. You were brave in that mill race. I was watching you, and it gave me courage. A most delicious feeling stole over Snowflake. She asked, Who made us? Why did we fall? Why were we sent here? Did you ever feel as though someone loved you very much and was watching over you? Raindrop replied, I do not know. I only know that since I first saw you, I have not been able to think of anything else. Only you. Will you come with me, Snowflake? For a time then, Snowflake and Raindrop glided along silently side by side down the blue and golden path made by the reflection of the setting sun in the sky. Dear Snowflake, Raindrop said. Dear Raindrop, Snowflake replied shyly. Then they united, one with the other. And thereafter, they continued to flow with the river, and were no longer two, but one. United, they felt secure against anything that might befall them. Sometime later, Snowflake cried out, Raindrop, where are we? What has become of our river? Raindrop looked. The banks of the river past which they had been gliding for so long were no longer there. Oh, said Raindrop, who knew many things. We have flowed into a lake. How splendid. Now we may rest for a while. Snowflake and Raindrop 
remained in the lake for many days and weeks, resting, drifting idly, and learning many things about the world in which they were living. Sometimes they floated close to the shore amidst green lily pads, crowned with yellow and white pond lilies, where the water birds rustled in the reeds and frogs and turtles sun themselves on old logs. The voices of the frogs changed from their spring to their summer songs, and the turtles stared with sleepy eyes. Time passed. There came a day when Raindrop said to Snowflake, Have you noticed anything? I do believe we're moving again, she replied. Yes, we've come to the end of the lake. The long, happy rest was over. The journey had begun again. One day, not long after they had left the lake and were floating with the river through a green valley, Raindrop said, Snowflake, dear, whose are all those many little voices I seem to hear all about us? And to whom do you speak from time to time? Snowflake smiled shyly and said gently, I was wondering when you'd notice. Those are our children, dear Raindrop. They're called Snowdrop, Rainflake, Snow Crystal, and Raindrop Minor. Snowflake seemed from then on to be busy from morning until night, keeping them clean, brushing away bits of oil or soot or dust, watching to see that they did not stray too far from her side. Thus one day seemed to pass like another in contentment and interest. They happened to be traveling close to the left bank at that time, and suddenly, before they were aware of it, a narrow opening appeared in it, with a kind of floor of stone paving that was slanted sharply downhill for a short distance, so that they were unexpectedly swept into it with a rush. Raindrop looked grave. I do not like this at all, he said. Snowflake now became alarmed herself, for she'd never seen Raindrop so serious or disturbed. She cried, What is happening? Are we in danger? I do not know, Raindrop replied, but keep the children together and stay close to me. Whatever, we must not be separated now. He dropped his voice in a whisper. If only we do not meet our greatest enemy. Snowflake said softly, Who is our greatest enemy, Raindrop? Whisper it to me. I don't want the children to see how frightened I am. Shh, Raindrop replied. Have courage. Remember, I'm with you. But the tunnel through which they were dashing grew more chill and narrow all the time. Faster, faster, faster. Some mighty power had them in its grip. Then without warning, they felt themselves being snatched upwards. Raindrop cried, Courage, Snowflake! It is our most bitter foe, fire! There was a house in a crowded city street before her. Black smoke and yellow flames were pouring from the roof and windows. Orange tongues of fire were licking upwards. Then, with the powerful stream of water shot from the brass nozzle of the hose held by the fireman, Snowflake was hurled straight for the center of the fiery furnace. The heart of the fire glowed red and evil. Bright blades of yellow flames leaped like sword strokes to destroy all in their path. Gasping for life, all but seared by the blast from the raging furnace, Snowflake was near to giving way to despair and defeat. She recalled what Raindrop had said. Give all your strength, all your heart and soul. We must win. And in that moment, she thought of the one from whom her heart and soul had come, and she cried out to him, Help us! Remember when I was a child you loved me. If you must, take me, but spare Raindrop and my children. In that instant, Snowflake and all those who were rallied beside her in the fight against the Red Destroyer struck at the glowing heart of the living flame and vanquished it. 
When, much later, she returned to her senses, it was to find herself trickling down the side of the blackened building, all soiled and dirtied from the soot and cinders. At that instant, with a surge of joy, Snowflake saw Raindrop and the children flowing down a charred beam nearby, and forgetting about herself in the happiness of finding them, she felt her strength return. But the greatest change Snowflake was sad to see and which filled her with foreboding had taken place in Raindrop. The strain of the heroic struggle against the fire had left him altered. His pear-shaped figure was no longer as smooth and robust as it had been, and he never seemed to recover his former gay and joyous spirit. He looked worn and older, and was apt to have long periods when he was moody and silent. Yet always he was loving and kind to Snowflake and the children. When his eyes rested upon Snowflake, they were filled with such tenderness that her own heart was swelled nearly to bursting. One morning, as they drifted slowly on the bosom of the broad, placid river, passing through flat meadows, where many windmills, stirred by the just-awakened breeze, revolved slowly against the pale sky, Snowflake became aware that Raindrop was no longer with her. The question that tormented her brought back to her thoughts of the mysteries of her childhood and she asked the one who had made her in the long ago, Was it you who called him? Shall I ever see him again? There was no reply, but the wind rustling the sails of the windmills. 
The children crowded around her to comfort her. They put their arms around her and said, Don't cry. We will never leave you. Snowflake looked at them, smiling through her grief, and wondered. But they were no longer children. They had grown up. Now that Raindrop was gone, they were all she had. And to take her mind off grieving for him, she made plans for them. Time and the river flowed on. Clay, stirred up from a shallow bottom, turned the clear, sparkling blue of the waters to dull brown. It was like a soiled and tired traveler after a long trip, and Snowflake and the children took on this new color as well. Yet, as it is near to the finish of every journey, there was all the stir and excitement of impending arrival somewhere. The feeling that everything thereafter would be new and different. And deep in her heart, Snowflake knew that the time was not far distant, when in spite of the promises they had made, the children must go away. At its mouth, where it finally entered the sea, the great river divided into five, wandering past the scattered islands of the sunken land. Pausing only to bid a brief goodbye to Snowflake, each of the children chose a different branch. Each thought that his or her branch would lead most quickly to adventure and success, and when each of them reached the bend in the river branch, he or she paused only to turn around and wave a last farewell, and then was gone. Alone, Snowflake took the path to the blood-red west and the great sea. In the sea, all was changed from everything Snowflake had ever known. Its waters were deep, mysterious, and restless. Always the surface appeared moving and troubled, and Snowflake became a part of its aimless procession. The waters of the vast and boundless ocean were salt, and from then on, Snowflake always seemed to have in her mouth the bitter taste of tears. Everything in the sea was enormous compared with what Snowflake had known in the past. The waves, the currents, the fish and the ships. The giant cargo and passenger ships, weighing many thousands of tons, crushed her with their great bulk. Now that Raindrop was no longer there to share the burden, the entire weight of these ocean giants fell upon her. When the weather was bad, she tried sinking into the green and gloomy depths where it was always calm and still. But she was frightened there by the finny giants that came swimming up the stair with great round eyes as large as dinner plates. The storms too were terrifying. The raging winds whipped the surface of the sea into living mountains of grey waters, their crests white capped with salt froth racing before the gale. Yet the sea could be calm and friendly too, and there were days when the surface was as still as her lovely lake had been, with the sunshine sparkling on blue waters that were hardly more than ruffled by a delicate wind. But how vast and lonely it was at those times. Snowflake appeared to be the center of a wide and empty circle, made by the line where the sea met the sky all about her, and she learned what it was to be lonely. While she did not know where she was going, Snowflake had been driven steadily southwards. The water became warmer, the sun hotter, the seas calmer, and the storms less frequent. Gradually, Snowflake became aware of a change that was taking place in her. She'd felt that for some time she'd been growing weaker. The great zest for life and love of living was beginning to pass. And Snowflake knew that she must be approaching the end of her days. How this end was to take place, what it would be like, or where she would go, Snowflake could not tell. 
but she was aware that somehow it would have to do with the sun. She did not understand this, and it saddened her. But she remembered how happy she'd been the first time she'd seen it rise, and how she'd longed for it through the dark days when she'd lain buried beneath the snow on the mountainside. Then came the day when the sun, beating out of a brazen sky, appeared to concentrate its strength and power on her alone. She felt that she was being drawn upward from the sea, that the liquid life she had so loved was being drained from her, and that soon she would not be anymore. And in those last moments, her thoughts turned back to the days when she'd been young and to the questions that had never been answered. Why? What was the purpose of it all? And above all, who? The sea lay below her now. Already her form was altering from a lovely crystal drop. Soon there would be nothing left but a tiny feather of vapor drift in the sky. High overhead floated a soft white cloud. Was that her destination? Snowflake remembered that it was in a cloud she'd been born. Now her whole life seemed to roll by before her dimming eyes. She had fallen upon a mountainside, and a little girl with a red cap and mittens had passed over her on a sled. She'd gone tumbling down the hillside in the spring and had awakened a sleeping violet in a wood. She'd been caught in a mill race and turned the miller's wheel to grind wheat so that a woman could bake a loaf of bread for her husband and her children. She'd merged with a dear and tender raindrop whom she loved and with him entered a lake where she'd spent the happiest days of her life. She thought of her children and the contentment of Raindrop on the long journey they'd made together. With a shudder, she remembered the awful duel with fire which she'd won. As she neared the white cloud drifting overhead, there came to her, in one brief flash of understanding, something of the vast and beautiful design woven by him who would create it all. How thoughtful and tender, how exquisitely beautiful, careful, and loving was the plan behind all that had happened to her from the very day she was born. And as she thought of the exquisite harmony of the universe in which she had been sent to play her part, peace and contentment came to Snowflake. Fainter and fainter beat her heart. Soon she would be Snowflake no more, but only a part of the vast, silent spaces of the heavens, a filmy fragment of an autumn cloud. And the last thing she could remember, before the sun drew her up into the heart of the cloud above, was that all about her, the air and the sky, seemed to ring with the tender and loving words. Well done, little snowflake. Come home to me now. Mm -hmm. 